This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March the 28th, 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 29. The House of Morel and Son. Anyone who had quitted Marseilles a few years previously, well acquainted with the interior of Morel's warehouse, and had returned at this date, would have found a great change. Instead of that air of life, of comfort, and of happiness that permeates a flourishing and prosperous business establishment, instead of merry faces at the windows, busy clerks hurrying to and fro in the long corridors, instead of the court filled with bales of goods re-echoing with the cries and jokes of porters, one would have immediately perceived all aspects of sadness and gloom. Out of all the numerous clerks that used to fill the deserted corridor and the empty office, but two remained. One was a young man of three or four and twenty, who was in love with Monsieur Morel's daughter, and had remained with him in spite of the efforts of his friends to induce him to withdraw. The other was an old one-eyed cashier called Coquelet, or Cockeye, a nickname given him by the young men who used to throng his vast and now almost deserted beehive, and which had so completely replaced his real name that he would not in all probability have replied to any one who addressed him by it. Coquelet remained in M. Morel's service, and a most singular change had taken place in his position. He had, at the same time, risen to the rank of cashier, and sunk to the rank of a servant. He was, however, the same Coquelet, good, patient, devoted, but inflexible on the subject of arithmetic, the only point on which he would have stirred firm against the world, even against M. Morel, and strong in the multiplication table which he had at his fingers' ends, no matter what scheme or what trap was laid to catch him. In the midst of the disasters that befell the house, Coquelet was the only one unmoved. But this did not arise from a want of affection, on the contrary, from a firm conviction. Like the rats that one by one forsake the doomed ship even before the vessel weighs anchor, so all the numerous clerks had by degrees deserted the office and the warehouse. Coquelet had seen them go without thinking of inquiring the cause of their departure. Everything was, as we have said a question of arithmetic to Coquelet's, and during the twenty years he had always seen all payments made with such exactitude that it seemed as impossible to him that the house should stop payment as that it would to a miller that the river that had so long turned his mill should cease to flow. Nothing had as yet occurred to shake Coquelet's belief. The last month's payment had been made with the most scrupulous exactitude, Coquelet had detected an overbalance of fourteen sous in his cash, and the same evening he had brought them to M. Morel, who, with a melancholy smile, threw them into the almost empty drawer, saying, "'Thanks, Coquelet. You are the pearl of cashiers.' Coquelet went away perfectly happy, for this eulogium of M. Morel, himself the pearl of the honest men of Marseilles, flattered him more than a present of fifty crowns, but since the end of the month M. Morel had passed on many an anxious hour. In order to meet the payments then due, he had collected all his resources, and, fearing lest the report of his distress should get bruited about at Marseilles when he was known to be reduced to such an extremity, he went to the Bocheret Fair to sell his wife's and daughter's jewels and a portion of his plate. By this means the end of the month was past, but his resources were now exhausted. Credit, owing to the reports afloat, was no longer to be had, and to meet the one hundred thousand francs due at the tenth of the present month, and the one hundred thousand francs due on the fifteenth of the next month to M. de Boisville, M. Morel had in reality no hope but the return of the Faron of whose departure he had learnt from a vessel which had weighed anchor at the same time, and which had already arrived in harbour. But this vessel, like the Farron, came from Calcutta, and had been in for a fortnight, 
while no intelligence had been received of the Theron. Such was the state of his affairs when, the day after his interview with M. de Beauville, the confidential clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome presented himself at M. Morel's. Emmanuel received him. This young man was alarmed by the appearance of every new face, for every new face might be that of a new creditor, come in anxiety to question the head of the house. The young man, wishing to spare his employer the pain of this interview, questioned the newcomer, but the stranger declared that he had nothing to say to M. Emmanuel, and that his business was with M. Morel in person. Emmanuel sighed and summoned Cocles. Cocles appeared, and the young man bade him conduct the stranger to M. Morel's apartment. Cocles went first, and the stranger followed him. On the staircase they met a beautiful girl of sixteen or seventeen, who looked with anxiety at the stranger. M. Morel is in his room, is he not, Mademoiselle Julie? said the cashier. Yes, I think so, at least, said the young girl hesitatingly. Go and see, Cocles, if my father is there. Announce the gentleman. It will be useless to announce me, Mademoiselle, returned the Englishman. M. Morel does not know my name. This worthy gentleman has only to announce the confidential clerk of the House of Thompson and French of Rome, with whom your father does business. The young girl turned pale and continued to descend, while the stranger and Coquet continued to mount the staircase. She entered the office where Emmanuel was, while Coquet, by the aid of a key he possessed, opened a door in the corner of a landing place on the second staircase conducted the stranger into an antechamber, opened a second door, which he closed behind him, and, after having left the clerk of the house of Thompson and French alone, returned and signed to him that he could enter. The Englishman entered, and found Morel seated at a table, turning over the formidable columns of his ledger, which contained the list of his liabilities. At the sight of the stranger, M. Morel closed the ledger, arose, and offered a seat to the stranger, and, when he had seen him seated, resumed to his own chair. Fourteen years had changed the worthy merchant, who, in his thirty-sixth year at the opening of this history, now was in his fiftieth. His hair had turned white, and his sorrow had ploughed deep furrows on his brow, and his look once so firm and penetrating, was now irresolute and wandering, as if he feared being forced to fix his attention on some particular thought or person. The Englishman looked at him with an air of curiosity, evidently mingled with interest. Monsieur, said Morel, whose uneasiness was increased by this examination, you wish to speak to me? Yes, monsieur. You are aware from where I come? The house of Thompson and French, at least so my cashier tells me. He has told you rightly. The house of Thompson and French had three hundred or four hundred thousand francs to pay this month in France, and, knowing your strict punctuality, have collected all the bills bearing your signature, and charged me, as they became due, to present them, and to employ the money otherwise. Morel sighed deeply, and passed his hand over his forehead, which was covered with perspiration. "'So then, sir,' said Morel, "'you hold bills of mine?' "'Yes, and for a considerable sum.' "'What is the amount?' asked Morel, with a voice he strove to render firm. "'Here it is,' said the Englishman, taking a quantity of papers from his pocket, "'an assignment of two hundred thousand francs to our house by M. de Boisville, "'the inspector of prisons, to whom they are due. "'You acknowledge, of course, that you owe this sum to him?' "'Yes.' He placed the money in my hands at four and a half per cent nearly five years ago. When are you to pay? Half the fifteenth of this month, half the fifteenth of next. Just so. And now there are thirty-two thousand five hundred francs payable shortly. They are all signed by you, and assigned to our house by the holders. I recognize them, said Morel, whose face was suffused as he thought that, for the first time in his life, he would be unable to honor his own signature. Is that all? No. I have, for the end of the month, these bills, which have been assigned to us by the House of Pascal, and the House of Wilde and Turner of Marseilles, amounting to nearly fifty-five thousand francs. 
in all 287,500 francs. It is impossible to describe what Morel suffered during this enumeration. 287,500 francs, repeated he. Yes, sir, repeated the Englishman. I will not, continued he, after a moment's silence, conceal from you that, while your probity and exactitude up to this moment are universally acknowledged, yet the report is current in Marseilles that you are not able to meet your liabilities. At this almost brutal speech Morel turned deathly pale. Sir, he said, up to this time, and it is now more than four and twenty years since I received the direction of this house from my father, who had himself conducted it for five and thirty years, never has anything bearing the signature of Morel and son been dishonored. I know that, replied the Englishman, but as a man of honor you should answer another. Tell me fairly, shall you pay these with the same punctuality? Morel shuddered and looked at the man, who spoke with more assurance than he had hitherto shown. "'To questions frankly put,' said he, "'a straightforward answer should be given. Yes, I shall pay, if, as I hope, my vessel arrives safely, for its arrival will again procure me the credit which the numerous accidents of which I have been the victim have deprived me. But if the Farron should be lost, and this last resource be gone—' The poor man's eyes filled with tears. "'Well,' said the other, "'if this last resource fail you?' "'Well,' returned Morel, "'it is a cruel thing to be forced to say, but already used to misfortune I must habituate myself to shame. I fear I shall be forced to suspend payment. Have you no friends who could assist you? Morel smiled mournfully. In business, sir, said he, one has no friends, only correspondence. It is true, murmured the Englishman. Then you have but one hope. But one. The last? The last. So that if this fail, I am ruined completely ruined. And as I was on my way here, a vessel was coming into port. I know it, sir. A young man who still adheres to my fallen fortune passes a part of his time in the Belvedere at the top of the house in hopes of being the first to announce good news to me. He has informed me of the arrival of this ship. And it is not yours? No, she is a Bordeaux vessel, La Gironde. She comes from India also, but she is not mine. Perhaps she has spoken the Theron, and brings you some tidings of her. Shall I tell you plainly one thing, sir? I dread almost as much to receive any tidings of my vessel as to remain in doubt. Uncertainty is still hope. Then in a low voice Morel added, This delay is not natural. The Farron left Calcutta 5th of February. She ought to have been here a month ago. What is that? said the Englishman. What is the meaning of that noise? Oh, oh, cried Morel, turning pale. What is it? A loud noise was heard on the stairs of people moving hastily and half-stifled sobs. Morel rose and advanced to the door, but his strength failed him as he sank to the chair. The two men remained opposite one another, Morel trembling in every limb, the stranger gazing at him with an air of profound pity. The noise had ceased, but it seemed that Morel expected something. Something had occasioned the noise, and something must follow. The stranger fancied he heard footsteps on the stairs, and that the footsteps, which were those of several persons, stopped at the door. A key was inserted into the lock of the first door, and the creaking of the hinges was audible. There are only two persons who have the key to that door, murmured Morel, Cocles and Julie. At this instant the second door opened, and the young girl, her eyes bathed with tears, appeared. Morel rose, trembling, supporting himself by the arm of the chair. He would have spoken, but his voice failed him. Oh, father, said she, clasping her hands, forgive your child for being the bearer of evil tidings. 
Morel again changed color. Julie threw herself into his arms. Oh, father, father, murmured she, courage. The Theron has gone down then, said Morel in a hoarse voice. The young girl did not speak, but she made an affirmative sign with her head as she lay on her father's breast. And the crew? asked Morel. Saved, said the girl, saved by the crew of the vessel that has just entered the harbor. Morel raised his two hands to heaven with an expression of resignation and sublime gratitude. Thanks, my God, said he. At least thou strikest but me alone. A tear moistened the eye of the phlegmatic Englishman. "'Come in, come in,' said Morel, "'for I presume you are all at the door.' Scarcely had he uttered those words when Madame Morel entered weeping bitterly. Emmanuel followed her, and in the antechamber were visible the rough faces of seven or eight half-naked sailors. At the sight of these men the Englishman started and advanced a step, then restrained himself, and retired into the farthest and most obscure corner of the apartment. Madame Morel sat down by her husband, and took one of his hands in hers. Julie still lay with her head on his shoulder. Emmanuel stood in the center, and seemed to form the link between Morel's family and the sailors at the door. "'How did this happen?' said Morel. "'Draw nearer, Penelon,' said the young man, "'and tell us all about it.' An old seaman, bronzed by the tropical sun, advanced, twirling the remains of a tarpaulin between his hands. "'Good day, Mr. Morel,' said he, as if he had just quitted Marseilles the previous evening and had just returned from A or Toulon. "'Good day, Penelon,' returned Morel, who could not refrain from smiling through his tears. "'Where is the captain?' The captain, Monsieur Morel, has stayed back, sick, at the Palma. But please, God, it won't be much, and you will see him in a few days, all alive and hearty. Well, now, tell your story, Penelon. Penelon rolled his quid in his cheek, placed his hand before his mouth, turned his head, and set a long jet of tobacco juice into the antechamber, advanced his foot, balanced himself, and began... "'You see, Monsieur Morel,' said he, "'we were somewhere between Cap Blanc and Cap Boyador, "'sailing with a fair breeze south-southwest after a week's calm, "'when Captain Gaumont comes up and says to me, "'I was at the helm, I should tell you, "'and says, Penelon, what do you think of these clouds coming up over here? "'I was just then looking at them myself. "'What do I say, Captain? "'Why, I think they are rising faster than they have any business to do.' and that they would not be so black if they didn't mean mischief. That's my opinion, too, said the captain. I'll take precautions accordingly. We are carrying too much canvas. Alas, they are all hands. Take in the studding sills. Bestow the flying jib. It was time. The squall was on us, and the vessel began to heel. Ah, paid the captain. We have still too much canvas set. All hands, lower the mainsail. Five minutes later it was down, and... We sailed under mizzen topsails and tagallantsails. Well, Penelon, said the captain, what makes you shake your head? Why, I says, I think you still have too much on. I think you're right, answered he. We shall have a gale. A gale? More than that. We shall have a tempest, or I don't know what's what. You can see the wind coming like the dust at Montreton. Luckily the captain understood his business. Take in two reefs and topsails, cried the captain. Let go the bullens. Haul the brace. Lower the tagallant sails. Haul out the reef tackles on the yards. That was not enough for those latitudes, said the Englishman. I should have taken four reefs and the topsails and furled the spanaker. His firm, sonorous, and unexpected voice made everyone start. Penelon put his hand over his eyes, then stared at the man who thus criticized the maneuvers of his captain. "'We did better than that, sir,' said the old sailor respectfully. "'We put up the helm to run before the tempest ten minutes after we struck our topsails and scudded under bare poles.' "'The vessel was very old to risk that,' 
said the Englishman. Eh, it was that that did the business. After pitching heavily for twelve hours, we sprung a leak. Penelon, said the captain, I think we are sinking. Give me the helm and go down into the hold. I gave him the helm and descended. There was already three feet of water. All hands to the pumps, I shouted, but it was too late, and it seemed that the more we pumped, the more came in. Ah, said I, after four hours' work, since we are sinking, let us sink. We can die but once. That's the example you set, Penelon, cries the captain. Well, well, wait a minute. He went into his cabin and came back with a brace of pistols. I'll blow the brains out of the first man who leaves the pump, said he. Well done, said the Englishman. There's nothing that gives you so much courage as good reasons, continued the sailor. And during that time the wind had abated, the sea had gone down, but the water kept rising. Not much, only two inches an hour, but still it rose. Two inches an hour does not seem much, but in twelve hours that makes two feet, and three we had before, that makes five. Come, said the captain, we have all done all in our power, and Monsieur Morel will have nothing to reproach us with. We have tried to save the ship, let us now save ourselves. To the boats, my lads, as quick as you can. Now, continued Penelon. Now you see, Monsieur Morel, a sailor is attached to the ship, but still more to his life, so we did not wait to be told twice, the more so that the ship was sinking under us and seemed to say, Get along, save yourselves. We soon launched the boat, and all eight of us got into it. The captain descended last. Or, rather, he did not descend, he would not quit the vessel. So I took him round the waist, and I threw him into the boat, and then I jumped after him. It was time, for just as I jumped the deck burst with a noise like the broadside of a man-of-war. Ten minutes after, she pitched forward, then the other way, and spun round and round, and then good-bye to the Farron. As for us, we were three days without anything to eat or drink, so that we began to think of drawing lots who would feed the rest. And then we saw La Gironde, and made signals of distress. She perceived us, made for us, and took us all on board. There now, Monsieur Morel, that's the whole truth, on the honor of a sailor. Is it not true, you fellows there? A general murmur of approbation showed that the narrator had faithfully detailed their misfortunes and sufferings. Well, well, said Monsieur Morel, I know there was no one in fault but destiny. It was the will of God that this should happen, blessed be his name. What wages do to you? Oh, do not let us talk of that, Monsieur Morel. Yes, but we will talk of it. Well, then, three months, said Penelon. Cocles, pay two hundred francs to each of these good fellows, said Morel. At another time, added he, I should have said, give them besides two hundred francs over as a present, but times have changed, and the little money that remains to me is not my own. Penelon turned to his companions and exchanged a few words with them. As for that, Monsieur Morel, said he, again turning his quid, as for that. As for what? The money. Well, well, we all say that Fifty francs would be enough for us at present, and we will wait for the rest. Oh, thanks, my friends. Thanks, cried Morel gratefully. Take it, take it, and if you can find another employer, enter his service. You are free to do so. These last words produced a prodigious effect on the seaman. Penelon nearly swallowed his quid. Fortunately, he recovered. What? Monsieur Morel, said he in a low voice, you send us away? You are then angry with us? No, no, said Monsieur Morel, I am not angry, quite the contrary, and I do not send you away, but I have no more ships, and therefore I do not want any sailors. No more ships, returned Penelon. Well, then you'll build some, and we'll wait for you. I have no money to build ships with, Penelon, said the poor owner mournfully, so I cannot accept your kind offer. No 
little more money. Well, then you must not pay us. We can scud like the Farron under bare poles. Enough, enough, cried Morel, almost overpowered. Leave me, I pray you, and we shall meet again in a happier time. Emmanuel, go with them and see that my orders are executed. At least we shall see each other again, Monsieur Morel, asked Penelon. Yes, I hope so at least. Now go. He made a sign to Cocles, who went first. The seaman followed him, and Emmanuel brought up the rear. Now, said the owner to his wife and daughter, leave me, for I wish to speak with this gentleman. And he glanced toward the clerk of Thompson and French, who had remained motionless in the corner during the scene, in which he had taken no part except the few words we have mentioned. The two women looked at this person, whose presence had been entirely forgotten, and retired. But as she left the apartment, Julie gave the stranger a supplicating glance, to which she replied by a smile that an indifferent spectator would have been surprised to see on his stern features. The two men were left alone. "'Well, sir,' said Morel, sinking into a chair, you have heard all. I have nothing further to tell you. I see, returned the Englishman, that a fresh and unmerited misfortune has overwhelmed you, and this only increases my desire to serve you. Oh, sir, cried Morel, let me see, continued the stranger. I am one of your largest creditors. Your bills, at least, are the first that will fall due. Do you wish for time to pay? A delay would save my honor, and consequently my life. How long a delay do you wish for? Morel reflected. Two months, said he. I will give you three, replied the stranger. But, asked Morel, will the house of Thompson and French consent? Oh, I take everything on myself. Today is the fifth of June. Yes. Well... Renew these bills up to the 5th of September, and on the 5th of September, at eleven o'clock, the hand of the clock pointed to eleven, I shall come to receive the money. I shall expect you, returned Morel, and I will pay you, or I shall be dead. These last words were uttered in so low a tone that the stranger could not hear them. The bills were renewed. The old ones destroyed, and the poor shipowner found himself with three months before him to collect his resources. The Englishman received his thanks with the phlegm particular to his nation, and Morel, overwhelming him with a grateful blessing, conducted him to the staircase. The stranger met Julie on the stairs. She pretended to be descending, but in reality was waiting for him. "'Oh, sir!' said she, clasping her hands. "'Mademoiselle?' said the stranger, one day you will receive a letter signed Sinbad the Sailor. Do exactly what the letter bids you, however strange it may appear. Yes, sir, returned Julie. Do you promise? I swear to you I will. It is well. Adieu, mademoiselle. Continue to be the good, sweet girl you are at the present, and I have great hopes that heaven will reward you by giving you Emmanuel for a husband. Julie uttered a faint cry, blushed like a rose, and leaned against the baluster. The stranger waved his hand, and continued to descend. In the court he found Penelon, who, with a rouleau of a hundred francs in either hand, seemed unable to make up his mind to retain them. "'Come with me, my friend,' said the Englishman. "'I wish to speak to you.'" So ends Chapter 29 The House of Morel and Son